Welcome to Empty Mentor, where we fill our cups and share our wisdom together. I am your host, Jennifer Hicks, and I am a board certified music therapist and licensed educator with over 20 years of experience as a clinician, educator, supervisor, and mentor. You can learn more about me and our MT Mentor podcast and membership group on my website at www.joyfulnoisesllc.com. You can click on the link at the bottom of the homepage to receive a free infographic and periodic updates, including previews of upcoming podcast guests and episodes. It is such an honor to welcome our guest mentors. Yes, it is plural for this episode, Beth Allard Yoder and Nathan Mensa. Beth Allard Yoder is a board certified music therapist with a master of arts in music therapy from St. Mary of the Woods College. She is a sole practitioner with a private practice serving children and adults with developmental disabilities. Along with her clinical work, Beth is also the integrator at Music Therapy Ed and has served as adjunct faculty at St. Mary of the Woods College. These roles bring all of her skills and passions together into her dream career. In all her work, Beth credits the power of our human musicality to connect us and create space for growth. Beth lives in Terre Haute, Indiana with her husband, pets, and ever-growing typewriter collection. She's always down to talk about space exploration, life with chronic illness, Walt Whitman, and folklore. So who knows where this conversation might lead. <laughs> Nathan Mensa, M-A-M-T-B-C, is a music therapist, too, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, who serves many patients and families, and an adjunct instructor for the music and theater department at St. Mary of the Woods College. He regularly participates in various musical ensemble, ensembles and presented at conferences and universities about topics related to music-centered approaches, musical authenticity, musical skill building, and music therapy with cardiology. Welcome, Beth and Nate. Hello. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> and we also should say for full transparency here that you both know each other, <laughs> that, <laughs> that you have been friends for a while. Um, and so part of why I was so excited to have this conversation with the two of you is because not only have you been um, mentors for me individually, but I'm also just inspired by the way that you support each other as colleagues and friends and think that's really important and lovely to share too. So let's just start by giving you the chance to tell our listeners a little bit about your music therapy journeys. Nose goes, Nate. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's cool. So my journey, like like many people in our field, I didn't come to music therapy straight away. Uh, I, initially, I wanted to be a pediatrician. And so I got a psychology degree um, from IU and I was a pre-med student and I then got a post-baccalaureate pre-medical studies and took the MCAT a couple of times and, and sent out med school applications the, and done medical research and the full shebang. And at the age of 25, as after all of that was set was when i finally said uh, i'm not i'm not sure anymore i'm not fully sure uh <laughs> you know and it's very timely that year i did a year of americorps with the aids united program so i was doing hiv prevention testing instruction and counseling in indy and finding different ways to assist different people in, in healthcare settings and uh <laughs> plot twist no one no one back in the early 2000s when i was in high school told me that you can help people medically without being a doctor which <laughs> luckily we now know thank mm -hmm. goodness but um so as i was searching for new things and like shoot what am i going to do now my sister who's a child life specialist was like hey nathan you should look at music therapy and I'm like, I've heard of that. I'm not sure. I don't think that's, I don't think that's for me. Like, I'm like, I'm a trumpet player. They sing and they play guitar and stuff. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't have that in me. And she's like, just look, you know? And it's like her ultimate, I told you so moment. She never 
lets me live it down. <laughs> I, shadowed, I shadowed someone. I read some books. Um, and I did a lot of research. And I, I pestered Sharon Boyle with endless emails, with which she sent back real quickly. And I, I fell in love with it. And I'm like, I got to I got to do this. Um, I, I got to do this. And, and so I did. And then went to St. Mary of the Woods where I met uh, Beth and her now current husband, Joel. And uh, then did my internship at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And they didn't hate me so much because they, they, they hired me. Uh, and I've, I've been here for about four years now. So, yeah. Thank you, Nate. So Beth, was your journey circuitous as well? How did you come to music therapy? Uh, my, kind of, in a way. I knew I wanted to do something with music. That's what I landed on as I got toward the end of high school. And I really need, I, I had had all sorts of careers in mind. Um, from as early, the, the first career I remember saying I wanted um, was probably fifth grade. And I wanted to work for um, Mission Control in Houston. Um, with the, like That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work mm -hmm. for Mission Control. There's a lot of science and a lot of math. And I was not gifted with that. Um, so that kind of fell to the wayside. Um, I wanted to be a meteorologist. I wanted to be a history teacher. I wanted to be a writer. I, I had all these things. Um, and then as I got toward high school, I'm like, okay, no, I, I, I think I want to do something with music. Um, which is kind of funny because it didn't really come up much in all of my list of things that I wanted to be um, right until the very end. And I applied for colleges. I looked into what my options were and none of it felt like a good fit. Um, mm. Pretty much we're looking at the colleges that were in my price range and in the area I was looking at. It was performance or education. And I knew I did not want to do performance. I have never been a performer at heart. Um, I, you know, did the recital thing, did the, all that. And it just, I, I was never what I liked to do. I did not a performer. Um, so I looked into education. I'm like, oh, I'll be a teacher. But it just wasn't quite the right fit. Um, and so I, I was looking into, okay, maybe I want to do special education. Maybe I want to work, you know, I have a family member with autism. Maybe I want to work with special needs children. Um, and... I was talking to my piano teacher, who had been my piano teacher for you know, 10 years, um, and I was talking with her, and, and she printed out an article from the AMTA website, handed it to me, and said, have you ever heard of this music therapy thing? And I think a college in Terre Haute has it. And I'm like, okay. Had no clue. This was my senior year of high school. I had never wow. heard of it mm -hmm. at all until then. Um, and I read it, and I'm like, okay. The, the things that jumped out to me was that it wasn't performance based, mm -hmm. that you could work with a lot of different instruments. I didn't have to, you know, pick piano and that's all I yeah. could do. Or, you know, it's like yep. I'm, a lot of different instruments and you could work with all these different populations and all this stuff. I'm like, okay, this seemed to bring together at the time what I thought were the things that were guiding me toward a career. And I talked to Sharon Boyle, talked to, you know, St. Mary of the Woods College, and I was like, yeah, I think this is what I want to do. Um, but for me, what really, like, solidified in my mind, there's this moment where it's like, I want to be a music therapist, and I know I'm on the right track, was in my intro course with Sharon. Um, she was playing us video excerpts of all these different styles of music therapy, different populations, and she played a video of Alan Turry working and mm -hmm. Nordoff Robbins Music Therapy. And I saw that and I was like, that is what I imagined when someone explained music therapy to me. That's what I had in mind. And that's magical. That's what yeah. I want to do. And I've never quite let go of that. Um, that was that was the moment for me. And that's kind of what I kept coming back to. Um, so it was a pretty straight line after that. I you know, went through, did the thing, four years, did my internship <laughs> and and graduated. And... Then after that, it has been a labyrinth of things. It has, it has been, I describe it as a choose your own adventure career. <laughs> um, yes, yes. So that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. I, I did my internship, took a job right afterwards, did that job for about a year. And I was like, mm, this isn't quite the fit. Quit that job, started a master's and a private practice at the same time. Not my biggest recommendation, but I did it. <laughs> Um, so started that I decided, okay, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it on my own terms. Cause I'm, <laughs> if I'm going to choose my own adventure, I want to be turning the pages. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to choose this and, um, picked up a side gig with music therapy ed during that first job to just do some virtual assistantship, 
which then turned into now my full-time job as integrator at Music Therapy Ed, mm -hmm. um, working with Kat Fulton. Um, I still have my private practice, so I'm still a sole proprietor there, see a handful of clients, and uh, I do some adjunct teaching. I just signed up to adjunct teach again this spring, um, clinical skills for music therapy sophomores. So a little bit of everything, a little bit of everything. Um, yeah. So it keeps evolving. Um, but one thing <laughs> that hasn't changed is I still want to be a Nordoff Robbins music therapist. Mm. So that's still still mm -hmm. on the path yeah. for that. Um, but how I've been getting there, I mean, haven't even hit my first recertification cycle yet. And I feel like I've done like six different <laughs> paths already. So um I've just accepted oh. that uh, that's that's the way I'm doing things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really appreciate, you know, you talked about the the magic that you felt in the music and, and watching Alan and, and learning from him. And, and we've had these conversations and both of you have been such mentors to me in keeping that awe of the music and keeping my own relationship with the music and, and my own authentic relationship with the music and, and prioritizing my musical wellness. And I'm, I'm so grateful to both of you for that. And we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but first though, I wanna talk a little bit about overall wellness and what that means to you both. And Beth, I know that um, life with a chronic illness is something that you like to share about. And so I wanted to give some space to, to bring that into the conversation as well, since we're talking about wellness today. Great. I think that my chronic illness is actually one of the things that have really driven my desire and my tendency to do that, that piecemeal, you know, choose your own adventure sort of thing because you know, I was diagnosed um, with a chronic illness um, at 16, whether it's fibromyalgia or it's chronic fatigue, whatever, it doesn't quite have a name yet working on that. Mm -hmm. But I've had the same chronic illness since I was 16. There was a defining moment where I was a typical healthy teenager and then after that I was not. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, you know, it really manifests in, you know, chronic fatigue, widespread pain, brain fog, the whole, the whole works. Yeah. And so I feel like it's this, I, I often describe it as like this monster I live with and we just have learned to get along because we inhabit the same body. Mm -hmm. um, and it really has impacted how I define and how I view my own wellness because wellness for me does not necessarily look like typical wellness. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've often had to fight against is people's perceptions of wellness and illness and what that means. Um, a really impactful conversation I had when I was doing my internship, working 40 hour weeks, and I was really struggling. And my internship director, um, Carol Decker, who is just wonderful and very accommodating and, and just very supportive, made the comment to me, she's like, you know, you, I don't, you know, you may not be able to do a 40 hour a week job. And I said, I know, and I'm sorry. And she said, why are you apologizing? She said, it's fine, you, you don't have to. <laughs> And yeah. I think that there's something yeah. that's put in our minds as a young professional, this mm -hmm. idea of, you know, 40 hours is the minimum, and then you give and give yeah. and give. And I realized I couldn't and be well. Um, mm. So that was the first time, you know, challenging that idea of, okay, maybe I, maybe that's not the right fit for me because yeah. then I'm, I can't do the rest of my life. Um, so, you know, often my wellness looks like illness. Mm -hmm. um, me being well, me taking care of myself looks like taking a sick day or looks like having to say no to something because I know it's going to yes. push me too far. Um, so coming to a place of peace with what wellness looks like for me, mm -hmm. um, which also really shaped, and as we'll get into later, what I picked for my thesis. Um, yes. Then I was also diagnosed with um, adult ADD in the last month of my master's program. And um, <laughs> I was... <laughs> Looking, I got a you know got a new doctor, and he pieced everything together, and we're talking about my my chronic fatigue and all this stuff, and he asked these questions, and he's like, "Has anyone ever like brought up that you might have ADD?" And I'm like, "No, I don't, I don't think so." Um, and so he put me on medication for it, and I came to realize that a lot of the things that I thought were character flaws. Was, I, I really was just a little deficient in dopamine, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, so figuring that out and realizing it's like, oh, okay, I just needed a little, a little tweak here, you know, adjust something and it's better. And accepting then it's like, oh, 
these are, I, I need to be careful of how much I'm bringing on my plate. And I think I'm multitasking, but I'm not doing it well. So this awareness, yes. my chronic illness, both of them have really made me have to be hyper aware of how all of my life plays together. Mm-hmm. And I think that that has really impacted my own perception of wellness and what it means to be well. Um, especially when, if you have a chronic illness, your, your well may still be sick. Mm-hmm. You're still, you still have an illness. Yes. Um, and so learning to accept that and work with that, I think it's a really, um, deep personal journey mm-hmm. and one that doesn't always play well with professional expectations. <laughs> so it's, uh, yes. it's, it's been a, it's been a ride for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Particularly in a capitalist um, society, and and where so often we tend to feel like our worth is determined by our productivity and by our output, um, mm-hmm. when in reality that is not true. And and I love that idea of defining for you what is wellness for me. What does that look like in my body? What does that look like in my life for me to be well? Nate, what does wellness look like for you? Uh, it's very multidimensional, right? So, you know, am I, you know, when I'm thinking about wellness, I'm asking myself, am I physically well? Am I emotionally well? Um, mentally well? Spiritually well? Mm-hmm. Um, I Religion is a very, very big aspect of my life. So mm-hmm. um, I truly believe that if, if things are not as they should be between the father and I, and and a hundred times out of a hundred, it's going to be my fault and not his. <laughs> that is going to be affecting me with something, right? Um, yes. Of course, am I am I musically well? Which is not even something I had comprehended until grad school. I think that Beth was really real ahead of the curve um, with that thesis topic, uh, both in my own journey and in the journey of music therapists in general because mm-hmm. it was like this kind of this big light bulby moment because I mean Beth and I like talk about a few things like over and over like musical wellness we talk about over and over Avengers Endgame we yeah. talk about <laughs> over and over <laughs> and, and, yes. and so <laughs> <laughs> so we many. made it 28 minutes, Nate. 28, 28 minutes. minutes. That's pretty good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, and so many other things we talk about over and over. But like, oh, and and the like the fact that not many, the fact that more music therapists don't um, prioritize the musical domain is another something that we come to all the time. Mm-hmm. So when she talked about musical wellness, I was like, oh, duh if that's a very strong domain of music therapy and one that we talk about all the time, of course, that'd be a form of wellness. And it was just, I mean, it was just kind of spiraling here, spiraling here, um, a game changer for me um, because there were definitely parts of um, grad school, especially near the beginning where I had not been musically well. I wasn't allowing uh, myself to in, engage in what I needed to engage in. So mm-hmm. kind of checking those boxes from multiple domains and such. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So so let's tell the listeners a little bit about that thesis project, Beth. And full disclosure, um, I was interviewed as part of it. So <laughs> I've been so excited. <laughs> to get to share some of Beth's work with all of you, um, having been a little part of that journey and and um, and just being honored to get to read the final product and, and continue to learn from Beth in our relationship too. So Beth, tell our listeners about that project and a little more about this idea of musical wellness. Okay, I am really excited to talk about it because I, I wrote it and I got it bound and I put it <laughs> on my shelf and then that's where it's been. So it's really excited to like bring it out and talk about it. Um, so my, my thesis was, I really grappled with this question for a good year and a half of what is musical wellness. And frankly, at this point, I don't even remember how I got there. I started on something completely different, but I just felt this, um, pulling to looking at through my work, especially working, um, and supporting other clinicians and, and having my peers and students around me, looking at um why you know, burnout was a big question why, why is burnout mm-hmm. so high 
And why am I feeling burned out? Because I went through a period of burnout not even a year into the profession, um, and that was really impactful for me. And so it's like, what, why? <laughs> why are we going through this? And is there something unique about our experience as professionals that is feeding into that that maybe we're not addressing? Because often, and there's great literature on burnout, amazing literature, um, but it was missing something for me. Um, I felt like there was this puzzle piece that I had built everything around, but I didn't have that piece. And the more I built around it, it was kind of, I was seeing the shape of it, but I'm like, I don't know what goes there. Um, so the, the title of my thesis was Musician Heal Thyself. Um, mm -hmm. And that idea of if we aren't musically well, we really can't bring on the burden of helping others become well musically. Um, and so I, I wrestled with this. So my you know, official answer on what, you know, the, the put on the, the suit answer for how I define <laughs> musical wellness after yes. the study and the interviews and, and all of that, I came to a definition of um, musical wellness being the dynamic intrapersonal process of achieving full potential through which an individual becomes aware of and moves toward the interconnectivity of musical, emotional, and professional self-actualization. So that was the, Whoa. the suits, the suits answer. Yeah. Right. Like I, why, why don't you say that one more time? Nice and slow. Okay. All right. Let's, I feel like I'm reading that in, you know, when you read the AMTA definition of music therapy oh my that, that's, yeah. that yes. I still yes. don't have memorized. Yeah. That's where I feel like I'm at. Um, okay. Musical wellness is the dynamic intrapersonal process of mm -hmm. achieving full potential through which an individual becomes aware of and moves toward the interconnectivity of musical, emotional, and professional self-actualization. You know how there's that, that uh, I can't remember which music therapy book it is, that is nothing but the definition, but they, they mm -hmm. right. Is, is yeah, it yeah, Brucia? Yeah. I feel like I, I'm on yeah. Jeopardy. I think it is, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Shout out to Brucia. We've got yeah, finding music yeah. therapy right here. That, Lots of totally, sticky notes. They're, they're totally gonna do that with your definition someday. Brucia's gonna. <laughs> There you go. It's yeah, and they have that, yeah, that assignment where then you have to write your own definition and you're like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> cool. I would love that. Um, <laughs> hopefully it takes them less time than a year and a half to come up with other ones than I did. But, um, <laughs> but for me, that, so in the my thesis, what I did was I looked at models of wellness, um, the illness wellness continuum, the wheel of wellness. Um, and the, the six dimensions of wellness, those models um, from the wellness, um, the holistic modality, um, looking at those models, and then I wanted to conceptualize it from a music therapy professional perspective. Um, and starting with what it means for us as music therapists, because I don't think we can bring this idea to our clients until we bring it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that was a real personal conviction of mine. And I feel like, yeah, it's like, we gotta, we gotta fix this for us first. Um, and through the, the, the interviews and through doing that, I developed a, you took the illness wellness continuum, which I can share that, um, illustration with you, Jen, if I haven't already, but took that yeah. continuum mm -hmm. and I redesigned it to, instead of it being physical wellness, looking at professional wellness. Um, and on one end, um, on the illness wellness continuum for physical, you know, the, the end game of illness is premature death. Okay, which sounds really dark, but I consider premature death exiting the field, a premature death of a career, a career that didn't yeah. live its full potential. And then on the other side is self-actualization. That's the high end goal, like Maslow's pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. But then in the middle, there's this, this space of you're neither ill nor well. You're just there. You're, you're in the state of neither. And I think a lot of times um, our self-care uh, paradigms get us we're no longer in burnout we're not ill anymore but for me personally often they weren't ever actually helping me be well um i didn't know how to help them be well i just knew how to not be unwell mm -hmm. um so I, this thesis helped me conceptualize musical wellness as a seventh dimension of wellness for music therapists we have those six dimensions and you know they're all these, you know, like Nate mentioned, you know, physical and mental and emotional and spiritual and community and like all these things. But if you put musical in there, it really changes the conversation because 
one thing that kept coming out in all the wellness models was if you're unwell in any of the facets, you're unwell. Mm-hmm. You can't just say, mm-hmm. hey, I'm fine everywhere except my, my mental health is awful. But everything else is fine, so I'm okay. No, you have something that needs addressed. <laughs> that will show up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it will show up. And you can't disconnect these parts. You are a whole mm. entity. Um, and so for me, it's it's that idea of what kept coming out and what kept coming back. And I had tons of discussion. And Nate listened to so many just me awesome. trying to grapple with this so, um, awesome. <laughs> so many discussions of there's a lot of talk about um work-life balance separating work you know, put work in a box so you can have your life and the question I kept coming back to as I was developing my thesis was but what if music is in both boxes yeah. what if there aren't boxes what if music is there because if I put music in the work box now music isn't in my life box mm-hmm. anymore and so that model fell apart for me. That idea fell apart for me. And frankly, it was the only professional wellness tool I had really been given as a young professional was yeah. get a good work-life balance, learn how to leave work at the door. Mm. And so when that didn't work, that's what really led me to, okay, so what, where, how can we go to the next step with this? And are we, is there something bigger that we're missing? Are we looking at the symptoms and not the cause? Mm-hmm. And, um, It was a really fascinating, I feel like I, it kind of wrote itself. I learned myself um, and that was, it was a fun journey to go on. And at the end, when it all started to come together and that definition started to come together, I was like, oh, there's something here. (laughs) I have (laughs) something. Yes. Um, So that was really wonderful. Oh, thank you, Beth. And if it's all right with you, we'll share the link um, and that image that you have for the continuum as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in our notes for this show too, so that people can have the, the opportunity to benefit from that as, as well. Nate, what does musical wellness mean to you? And double uh, points if you can um, replicate that definition without looking at any notes. Uh, <laughs> no way. I can. So. No. <laughs> if you can, I'll be so was, How impressed would you be, though, if I was like, well, as quoted by Beth Allard Yoder in the year, blah, 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 musical wellness is. Yes, I like oh, the man. citing of her, too. That's really important. Make sure we're yes, citing Beth on this. That would yes. be, that'd be so cool. Um, <laughs> So musical wellness to me is is tapping into who I am as a musician. So who I am as a musician is someone who likes being involved in many different things. Mm-hmm. Um, I get bored really easily in so many facets of my life. Music is not one of those aspects, but even doing the same thing, even in, in a in a field like here at a a children's hospital where every day is different it started to become predictably unpredictable so even that I was like still still need more you know different different you know um diversity and things so whether that was challenging myself to to learn a new instrument um like bass guitar and start using that in sessions or to really really lean hard in a direction of songs that I typically would not learn and learn those and incorporate those and see what happens or say, I'm not allowed to use my guitar for this entire week and see what mm, happens. Yeah. Um, you know, those things that keep me musically fed and, and outside of, of uh, being a music therapist and even inside just finding new and diverse ways to still engage with that. So whether it's, um, you know, I, I, I try to play music for the services of remembrance here. Uh, there's a children's program at our Seacrest Studios that I, I do music for like once a month. Um, there's a, a, a choir of um, medical employees that I, I help to co-lead uh, here that, that keeps me fed. And then outside of work, you know, occasionally playing with my worship team, used to uh, play with my ska band and now kind of play with this group of, of, of doctors like only a couple of times a year, but still a lot of fun. Called the Band Aids. Yeah, <laughs> that's that fun. Yeah, it. it's so it's so fun. Um, and that's awesome. and then just yeah, engage in different different things. You know, before this started, I was telling you how I was doing a short film score for my oldest sister, who is who's just finished film school, and and even working on a, a really big uh, music composition thing that 
I can't share yet, but I'm real excited to share when it's done. Um, <laughs> and just other things and other things. Yes. And, and that's what's good to, to me personally, where I'm like, oh, there's this and oh, there's this and, and oh, there's this rather than just one thing. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that Beth was talking about, though, it's important to be who you are. So yes. to others, that would be panic attack. Like, oh, my gosh, why are there so many things um, to work on? And that would be fine. But for me, it's like, sweet, there's like five different things going on. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it comes back to so. Yeah, go, sorry. Go for it. No, go for it. I used to be so jealous of you, Nate. Like, I was like, oh, Nate does all this stuff, all this musical stuff, and I suck. Like, I was just, <laughs> I was just like, I was like, so if you're listening can't... now, <laughs> you're thinking, yeah. I suck. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was so jealous of the performers in our group mm. and the people who just loved to perform. Because I mentioned earlier, performance is not part of my musical identity. Yeah. And But it looks so cool. And I was so jealous of their willingness <laughs> to just grab an instrument and try it. And they know all these songs. And I would just go home and be like, I, I am I even a musician? Mm. Like, I don't play. I don't perform. Am I a musician? Nate, you probably remember when we did our, like, our thesis topic defense presentations. Uh -huh. I opened with the question, raise your hand if you identify as a musician. Now, keep in mind, this was a whole room of music therapy master students. Yes. And there were a lot fewer hands raised right away than you would imagine. Mm, yeah. And so that to me is like, that's not a, um, I don't think that's a strange phenomenon. I think, you know, that idea is like, oh, I don't, I don't perform. So I'm not a musician. Um, yeah. So I, I just remember that was such a big, that was a big hurdle for me to get over. Cause I was just mm -hmm. so in awe of all, of all your musical stuff. Um, Says the piano goddess. <laughs> <laughs> whatever <laughs> well and you. i think this comes back to what you were talking about earlier with overall wellness which is we need to define it for ourselves mm -hmm. right and so beth what does what does musical wellness look like for you in real life what does that look like for you uh for me what it looks like for me musical wellness um it a lot of it is how i use music to support all the other wellnesses, the role that music plays mm -hmm. in my life. Um, I think I had mentioned you know, a while back, a conclusion I came to was those like approaches in music therapy we talk about, like receptive and recreative and improvisational, those, those approaches, um, I began thinking of those as musical engagement for myself. And that, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay that sometimes it's just receptive. It's yes. okay if it's all creative or if it's recreative. Um, mm -hmm. And that to me was really a big moment. Um, and for me, musical wellness, it looks like taking in a lot of music, a lot of good mm -hmm. music. It's, it's yes. like comfort food. Um, I make playlists. I've made a playlist now for every year. On my birthday, I start a new playlist. And so looking, I have these playlists to go back to. Um, I have some music that is just real, truly like comfort food musically. Mm -hmm. And I just come back to it a lot. Um, playing music, being a lot more intentional in, in the playing that I have, um, yeah. play, sitting down playing at my piano and it, you know, it's okay if it's the same song over and over again. <laughs> you know, I, yes. I often find myself, especially when things are very overwhelming as they are right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want a lot of new. I want the, 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 this a couple really dear things and I come back to playing it a lot and singing it a lot and, um, and for me musical wellness is also when my musicality is an extension of the conversations and the way I'm interacting with people I send songs to people I improvise songs for people and send it to them um, I you know if I am working on something and I think of a song I'm like oh the lyrics of this really kind of fit with what I'm doing, like, mm -hmm. so connecting it in, um, and just having it be a, a more natural extension of who I am. Yeah. And embracing all those little musical, those little musical things, like, I'll harmonize with the vacuum cleaner. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll use it as a drone. I'll make up spot songs about things. I'll, you know, we'll be watching a show and I keep going back. So I'm like, I hear, like, l listen to what's happening. Like, so hearing the music, it's like, listen to what's happening there. You know, Nate knows we can talk about 
movie scores like oh my god infinitely, yeah infinitely. <laughs> um <Portals>. so <laughs> yeah so that and that sort of thing or just talking to my dad my dad is a huge prog rock guy and mm-hmm. he loves loves prog rock and so we'll just sit down and he'll you know, put on a genesis song and we'll talk about it and he's like can you tell that they're going into like 13 8 here and then 5 4 and i can't but it's really cool to hear him break it down um <laughs> and uh all that sort of stuff. So that has been if just, especially right now, musical wellness for me is allowing music to be part of my wellness yes. um, and allowing my musical self to get what she needs, whatever that looks mm-hmm. like at the moment, instead of trying to prescribe what that is. Yes. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it looks like for me right now. It's a tough one. It's a tough <laughs> question. I really yeah. wrestled with this one. Um <laughs> Well, and I love that it looks different for both of you, because I think that's really important for the students and professionals listening and and for all of us at different stages in our life or just being different beings, that musical wellness is not going to necessarily look the same for all of us. Um, And so what would you want those students and professionals who are listening? What advice would you give them about their musical wellness? What would you want them to know? You can go first, Nate. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, for me, what I, I want you to know is what, it starts with your identity. Mm. And just like every, we all have a different identity in a lot of different ways, and your musicality is a part of your identity, and mm. that means it's going to have uniqueness to it. Um, and it's being a reflection of who you are. It's, it's deeply personal. And your musicality and your musical wellness is not going to be prescriptive. Um, It's not something I can tell you how to be musically well. And, but I can tell you that I think it's something you should try to be, um, something you should be aware of. Mm -hmm. Um, But what that looks like for everyone is different. And so I think that with many things, um, figuring out what your wellness is, what your Mm -hmm. musicality is, and building from there and starting with that instead of starting with what you want it to be or what Ah. you wish it was or what you think it should be. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm learning more and more, you know, not as an excuse to get out of growth, um, which (laughs) I would love to take us all often, but um, you can't start with what the should be. You can't mm-hmm. start with an idea of, oh, if, if I, I wish I was that. Yeah. If you start with what you actually are and where you actually are and embrace that, that is turning towards self-actualization. Um, yes. Actualizing somebody else doesn't do anything for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. So. Yes. I want to say that one one more time to you all, right? Actualizing someone else doesn't get you, uh, finish it up here for me, Beth, anywhere closer right? To self-actualization. It doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't do anything for you. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think it it harms us. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's harmful to me. Anytime I've started to compare myself and say, oh, I I wish I was, look at them, look what they're doing. I should do that. It's often a real deviation from the growth I actually need to do. Um, Mm. So the biggest thing I would recommend if, if musical wellness is something you are curious about now and want to attend to and want to be aware of, one, I, I think it, it, it's part of our wellness whether or not we're talking about it. So I think we should talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so now that you're aware of it, now you have no excuses. <laughs> um, now that you know that it's a thing, um, being very honest with yeah. yourself about that musicality and starting with that. Who are you musically? Mm-hmm. What, what is your musical identity? How does your human musicality play out in you? Um, and that's where I would start. I think it's a good place to begin. Absolutely. Which Nate is a great lead in to all that you've taught me about musical authenticity and identity and all of that. So what, what, what advice, what recommendations do you have for students and professionals seeking to explore their own musical wellness? I kind of jump off what Beth said, you know, find it. It's going to, and it's not that, of course, I, I wish it were just that simple. Yeah, just find it. <laughs> Done. Uh, <laughs> but it's going to, it's going to take some time and some real um, inner searching. 
to get to that point because if it were something that was easily found, then it may not be uh, as authentic and real as you think. Or maybe mm. you are super in tune with it and you're like, I know who I am musically. And it's like, great, maybe, maybe that is you, but maybe it will take a little bit longer to find yeah. that. And loved what Beth said. Yeah, you're, you're not meant to be whoever else. I, I really, really wish um, that someone would have told me uh, even a few years <laughs> into this, this thing, like, hey, Nate, you're not meant to be blank music therapist or blank music therapist. You're meant to be you as a music therapist. Um, very important for all of them. Be you. Sure, if you like something that someone is doing, you know, pull, pull from that. Get some new um, colors to paint the easel with new tools for the toolbox. Sure, but ultimately you're you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You talked a little earlier about the different dimensions of self-care for you and that spiritual is another one that's really important for you in your life. What are some of those other favorite self-care practices for any of the dimensions um, that you incorporate into your life, Nate? Um, let's see. Physical activity. So I am definitely not like a, a, a jock or a workout buff, but you know, like sometimes just going for a walk or even um, a quick 20 minute workout or something, I, I think does wonders for, you know, the endorphins and, and everything like that. Um, mentally, after really tough days of work, I, I always tell people, um, gummies and cartoons that's that's me like it, it, it never fails like oh great yeah gummies cartoons that's gonna be gonna be great anything that'll help me dissociate from reality as as much as possible uh, and and then you know i'm real fortunate to have some awesome family and friends uh in, mm -hmm. in my corner and i think for the emotional and social component that is huge right there, you know, yeah. keeping in contact with people, whether it's Facebook message or texting or calling, um, Zoom, you know, whatever, just to be able to talk to those individuals. This really reminds me of like, oh, this is this is awesome. Like I got to got to talk with Blank and Blank's so cool. I'm glad I'm friends or with Blank. I'm glad I'm related to Blank, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. Mm -hmm. What does it look like in your life, Beth? You know, uh, this is something I've been trying to be really intentional about recently, mm -hmm. um, especially with, um, you know, all the, you know, the COVID stuff and the staying at home yeah. stuff and um, all that, all that I became a lot more aware of that I needed some intentional self-care. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, my natural self-care is um, like gaming. Gaming is one. Gaming, watching, you know, TV, like Nate said, you know, anything is like, hey, hop, hop into another world. I love to to game with um, my husband and our family. We often get on with our siblings. So that's a big one. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's a ton of fun. Um, so I'm the music therapist with the, you know, custom built gaming PC. You know, <laughs> no one knows. It's my secret. You are not the only one I have a feeling. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, we need a discord. Seriously. I keep seeing that on Facebook and all these, we need to get together. Gaming music <laughs> therapist. Seriously. Um, but recently gratitude journaling, I got this five minute mm -hmm. gratitude journal. It just has five prompts a day that little moment of especially right now that moment of positivity and stopping and looking at some good in myself yes. and in my life has been very impactful mm -hmm. on my um, uh, emotional well-being um i've also really indulging in my hobbies indulging in my interests and just embracing them um like i said gaming's one keeping up with all of the you know space exploration spacex launches and nasa launches and following all of that um you know, recently my dad and I've started, we're working on building an antenna so I can make a ham radio contact with the International Space Station. So finding these, like all these like random things and just enjoying them. Yes. Separating myself and, and all those things, those facets, you know, I listed, I had these million careers that I wanted to do. <laughs> so those pieces of myself indulging yes. in things that feed those. Um, and honestly, the, the biggest thing recently has just been chilling in my hammock. I bought mm -hmm. a hammock for like the first time. And hung it up in my backyard, and I've just pretty much been living out there. So oh, <laughs> chilling in my awesome. hammock. It's nice to be outside. <laughs> being out, being outside has been a really big, big thing for me oh. and my self care. So yeah, 
Well, I know that your friendship and collegial relationship has been important for both of you. Who is another one of your mentors that you would like to give a shout out to today? Oh gosh, I feel like uh, <laughs> I, I I would not be a, a music therapist or be as decent a music therapist or connected musically as I am without Sharon Boyle. Just gosh, <laughs> I, can, I cannot give yep. her enough shout outs, honestly. Uh, <laughs> I really, really, really cannot. Um, as far as individuals that really connect with connect with and love music and have and have pushed me in different ways to keep on loving music um mm -hmm. james uh dana was a great friend from grad school and also alan turry um just like i mean that man loves music so much and it's it's really inspiring um yeah i'd say mm -hmm. i'd say those are those those are some i mean Beef already knows that she's an, she's an inspiration. So I don't even need to, yeah, go there. <laughs> I, I think that one goes without saying that, yeah, like, we'll yeah, just give the a, space yeah, yeah. that, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we can do a mutual admiration society here if you would like. Um, and <laughs> we'll give you no, a chance yeah, to thank some I, others I, too. Yeah, yeah. Sharon and Sharon and, and James and, and Alan and, and countless others, honestly, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll keep it at those three. <laughs> <laughs> How about for you, Beth, who have been mentors in your life? Nate, you st it took so many of my list, but I was, <laughs> I was I was prepared. I was expecting that. So Nate's list, and then um, for me, Kat Fulton has been a really big. You know, she has been. You know, I've worked alongside of her and worked for her in her company since I was just a little bitty baby music therapist. Um, but she's seen a lot of growth, and she has been a real. Um, just just guide for me mm -hmm. and really supportive in my, in my growth and giving me the opportunity to to stretch my wings and leadership and creativity and uh i really treasure our conversations and our relationship that we've had so i i look up and think of the world of her and mm -hmm. uh and just the way that she leads with love and and patience and creativity and bravery and uh but she's also very honest person mm -hmm. um and I yeah. really love that about people and all, all of my mentors um all of the people who I've looked up to yeah. that's the unifying factor in all of them and like in Nate's list of people who are incredible but really honest and authentic and vulnerable and willing to show their their humanity and their struggles and and share in that and I think that that is just um, such a gift. So I'm, I'm really yeah. lucky to be surrounded by so many people like that. Absolutely. And, and that is such an important piece to acknowledge is that we all struggle and it takes such courage to be vulnerability, to be vulnerable, to share that with others, to be open about those struggles. Um, and I think it is one of the gifts when we're able to do that. And, and I would love to create the space here for you to both share a perceived failure or a challenge or a struggle that you faced in life that has set you up for later success or taught you something important along the way. Ooh, yeah. oh man, yes. Yes? Ab yeah, Take yeah. It. Take Absolutely. it, Nate, go for it. Ab Absolutely. So um, when I, w it's funny, in that short amount of time, I, I was gonna talk about my, my uh, failed career as a pre-med that set me up for music therapy. I was a terrible pre-med student, but <laughs> this, I have a, a funnier one. So in, at IU, me and, and some other friends, we, who all loved video games, we were like, yeah, we should like put together a video game cover band. And this is, and it's, yeah, let's do this. And this is going to be great. <laughs> that band, while great in concept, because there's a, there's, there are a ton of great video game cover bands online that tour, that do this. So it's it's a great concept, but everything, we could not have done more things wrong, honestly. <laughs> I mean, like, first off, people tend to like to listen to songs and with lyrics instead of just instrumental stuff, you know, unless they're, they're hardcore video game nerds like us. So like strike one, um, strike two is your band shouldn't be 12 to 14 people that's that's way too many uh, <laughs> uh so strike three you shouldn't have i'm trying to remember the lineup it was like trumpet 
flute, euphonium, soprano sax, two guitars, two bassists, two drums, two, and two vocalists. It didn't make any sense. It didn't make it. <laughs> oh, we at the time like, yeah, this makes this makes perfect sense at the time. And yeah, we 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 made every musical mistake possible. M my composer friend and I, we basically were like, if it sounds cool, it's gonna go in the music, whether it was actually possible or not. I love that. <laughs> on the guitar music we made back in the day and all the in instruments for guitar and piano instruments, I now know how to play. I'm like, this is impossible. No wonder they <laughs> complained all the time. I like, <laughs> there's no way they were gonna do this. So there, there was, uh, and it's funny because anyone in, in my group of friends, um, if I mentioned the word sanctuary, they all know that it refers to this this one gig, this one gig we had outside. There were there was a song we just were not ready for, and it crashed and burned so poorly that in the middle of this gig, as the song was crashing and burning, I I literally stepped in front of the group and just cut them off. <laughs> like it was like we just, <laughs> it was it was so bad. Oh my gosh. But you know, that taught me and and my other friend who other friends who we still jammed at this this day and we've done so many other band things we're like cool we just learned how to do it completely wrong mm -hmm. now the next time we do this we've got it so yes. through mm -hmm. the various other groups we've had the ska stuff the soul stuff the musical stuff whatever have all been pretty great you know not yeah. flawless because nothing is but pretty great mm -hmm. we knew so much more what we were doing we were like hey let's not be <laughs> let's not be like that um it was it was called falcon punch and anyone who <laughs> understands yeah we had great names so awesome. yeah yeah and, and like i said great in concept but we just didn't know what we were doing but through that we learned so quickly hey that's all the wrong stuff but now we've got all the right <laughs> stuff yeah and, it, and it's it's just so funny that yeah the oh, that's awesome. Sometimes you just fail. <laughs> <laughs> Special shout out to any band members from Falcon Punch who are listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Beth, how about you? <laughs> how am I supposed to follow up Falcon Punch? Okay. <laughs> Actually, I, I kind of love this question because my favorite story for this this question is that cat tried to fire me oh. um i and she had a lot of reason to um this was about six months after i first started working with her in 2016 or 2017 and i was just a virtual assistant a contractor there's a small team of us and i had my tasks and i was just not keeping up I was taking on way too much responsibility and not delivering and she had to give me a call and mm -hmm. in her true cat form, very honest, very loving, but very honest <laughs> and very yes, just matter yes. of fact, um, you know, we're depending on you to get this stuff done. Things aren't getting done and like, it's not working. And so we're going to have to do, you know, 30 days and then you're done. So my 30 day notice. And that was, a really eye-opening moment for me because mm -hmm. I was unaware of how much my stress and my burnout and all that was affecting. I was blinded to that. Yes. And like my family was trying to tell me, my friends were trying to tell me, and I had just put these blinders on of like, it's fine if I just do more and push through and fake uh -huh. it till I make it, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And so to, to have that honest conversation and I just, I, I, broke down crying. I was just, I just broke and I was crying mm -hmm. and I was, and I was like, look, this job means a lot to me. Music therapy ad means a lot to me. I'm really struggling. And yeah. I, I was like, I got to the point where I'm like, can, can I have another chance? And Kat was like, absolutely. Okay. Another chance. Start clean tomorrow. Ugh. And we talked about it. We talked about what that looked like. And, you know, there yep. was that discussion of, okay, mm -hmm. well, we need to, here's the parameters and you need to do X, Y, and Z. And I needed that, um, guidance and that, the, that those boundaries but it was a really eye-opening thing to me because it was a point where my lack of taking care of myself and my denial about things was about to cost me something that meant a lot to yeah. me and so I had to sit down and say okay 
if this matters to me, then I need to fix what's getting in the way of me doing this well. Yep. And, you know, two years later, she's offering me a full-time job and I'm integrated <laughs> music therapy ed, right? We've worked together. And, and, and also in, you know, Kat, when she said, okay, clean start, it was a clean start. You know, there was no, it, we just started clean and I had that opportunity. Mm. And it was really great for me to have that second chance. I'm really grateful for that second chance because yeah. she would have been well within her right to just say, hey, you're done. Mm-hmm. Um, but it made me really look at that. And then it, it made me have to take really stock of, okay, if, if things are piling up, if you're getting overwhelmed, if you can't do yep. these things, it's indicative that there's something wrong. You're, yeah. you're overwhelmed. You're, and then, then layering on the, the retrospect of having ADD and not realizing mm-hmm. it and seeing those untreated things and how that plays out. Um, you know, I'm really grateful for that, but it set me up for success in that it one showed me that there were things that were worth fighting through my struggles for. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to fight for this because I really yeah. want this. Um, but also it made me have to, it had to kind of rip that bandaid off of like, I couldn't ignore it anymore. Yeah. And it was a very, the, the, some of the things that she said in that conversation have really stuck with me um, and helped me helped me really learn of, okay, if I'm going to be on a team, where, where is this load? If I take on things, if I, if I need to have to say no to something, how do you say no without a bunch of excuses? Mm-hmm. How do you just say no? How do you say yes and be intentional? And like, yes. it really gave me a space to explore and grow as a professional yeah. and, and as a person. And so that was, you know, we told that story when we went to a, a retreat for, um, you know, business owners, and it was a very similar question. And I'm sitting right beside her, and I'm like, yeah, she she tried to fire me. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, we work great together now. I do tons of stuff with music therapy, Ed. You know, like, it's an integral part of what I do. Yeah. Um, but I think that that was also, and for me, also that success of it's okay if you hit a rough patch. Yeah. That there are second chances, but mm-hmm. you've got to fix something. Yeah, something needs to change and that you can't just keep putting more on and oh, eventually something will stick. It'll be OK. Yeah. Um, I had to take things off my yeah. plate and I had to be. Yes. Aware, so oh, that was a really so important. important. Lesson. And it leads right into this next question, is, which is about making those changes um, that can really affect our lives. So what is what is a change that you've made in a habit or a belief that has really made a difference and improved your life? Your turn, Nate. <laughs> For me? Huh. Yeah. And and this year kind of jump started that because there's just kind of a self preservation type thing. Cause as as Beth said so beautifully, if you are, you know, if you're not working in certain ways, you know, it might be indicative of, of, of other things. For me, it was just kind of deciding first and foremost, and it, and it was a work in progress that I was no longer going to define my clinical success by how many patients I saw in a day or in a week. Ah, so mm-hmm. hard, um, yes. and still a work in progress. Um, it just, it's just not sustainable. Sometimes those things can't be controlled and other times they can, but what's the point of having, um, six sessions, in a day if you are just so burnt out and you're also not proud of those sessions i would much rather have three really really awesome sessions where so much growth occurred i'm really proud of them i helped actualize to help actualize my patients more and so on so on versus the the former so that was that was a change that had to occur because I was like, yeah, this is this just isn't working, and it's mm-hmm. just gonna be what it's gonna be, and it's been just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The world did not come to an end, right? The world did not come to an end, and yes. you know the beauty of it is that on some days where you get that superhuman strength and you have like a, a you know a, a crazy six or seven sessions or whatever, it's like great, but that's not gonna be every single day and and that's Mm -hmm. totally just fine yeah (laughs) beth is shaking her head yes yes (laughs) oh gosh 
Uh, such a that was such an important realization for me too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know we've had a lot of conversations about that, Nate. Of like, okay, <sighs> if you just do really well with one client, was it worth it? And it is, you know, mm-hmm. if it's yes. only one, yes. then you're still doing your job. And, um, oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I don't even follow that up. Nate. It was so good. Yeah, it, was so good. <laughs> um, it came from discussions with you. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a group response. <laughs> <laughs> kind of playing into that, honestly, you know, one of the bigger changes, I've made a lot of changes. Um, And, but I think one of the most impactful ones that has improved my life was seeking mentorship and seeking Mm -hmm. supervision. Um, You know, where I'm at, um, you know, I don't have a lot of other, you know, music therapy colleagues. I don't, I'm not working on a team. You know, I I don't have a lot of that natural kind of thing around me. I have my friends I talk to a lot, talk to Nate a lot. I talk to my, you know, best friend Paige a lot. And it's not quite the same um, Mm -hmm. as having that in that interaction, but I realized after grad school was over and I had that removal of, Oh, I have professors. I have these discussions in my cohort. And that's kind of naturally built into the process Mm -hmm. of, okay, now how do I intentionally seek out the things that I need without it being built into a program I'm doing, you know, that's getting out of that student mindset. Um, so I sought mentorship and I sought supervision and both have been very, very um, impactful for me. And starting with, you know, seeking super, you know, seeking mentorship is something I didn't realize I could do. <laughs> seeking mentorship for um, helping, having someone help me define what's important to me, my, my own values mm-hmm. and what I feel like my vision is instead of making it just a professional thing. What does my business look like? What does my yeah. clinical work look like? So that was really impactful. Um, and all of that kind of just the changed belief I think that has happened a lot is acknowledging that my life is, it's a relationship. My relation, it's a relation, music is a relationship. Um, my musicality, my, that relationship I have with music, um, Mm -hmm. is like, it is a relationship that needs work, that needs communication, that, that needs room to, to change and shift. And, um, but then also just the belief of seeing my life as a whole, that Mm -hmm. everything is instead of compartmentalizing my life, that it's all part of a whole. And viewing it that way has really changed. You know, COVID kind of forced me to do it because it made life really small for mm-hmm. a while. Yes. I had to cut most of my caseload. I was at home. I have not seen most of my friends in person since February. You know, like mm-hmm. it made life very small. And I think that when coming back into, okay, so what is really essential and what is really impactful here and what isn't serving me anymore and being really yeah. honest about that. And it has impacted almost every aspect of my life, but mm-hmm. coming back to that, that whole, and I am who I am in every aspect. Yes. It's not music therapy, Beth and music therapy, Ed Beth is integrator and space nerd, Beth and gaming <laughs> Beth. And like, th- no, there I, I'm, it's just Beth and it's yeah. my life. And changing that belief instead of one of, a bunch of boxes, I mm-hmm. think, really has impacted how I view everything. Yeah. I'm so excited that students are getting to listen to this uh, and, and learn from your wisdom. Uh, and I, so I want to jump to this question of, of what other advice would you two give to students studying music therapy right now? What do you want them to know? Because what you're sharing, I think, is so important for us at all stages of our careers. How about for those students starting out? Embrace all of you. Embrace all of who you are and what makes you who you are. Like um, the the things I use all my music therapy skills, everything I've learned in school, all the stuff I Mm -hmm. did, the proficiencies for and took a test on and studied for the boards. I use all those every day. I even use music theory every day. You're welcome, (laughs) Dr. Mac. Um, Uh. But I also use my writing skills Mm -hmm. every day. I use my nerdy interests and my excitement about things and my Walt Whitman collection and my, you know, all all these things, all these aspects of myself. Um, Don't feel like you now have to put on this 
music therapy suit and this I'm a music therapist and so therefore I only think and talk and do these things. I think out of a need for survival as a young professional, we kind of, and as a student, we put that on. Yeah. I'm a, we, all of our identity is, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm a junior at this college studying this. And th that is not all of who mm -hmm. you are. It's a part yeah. of who you are, but yeah. it's not all of it. So embrace all of you because that's what you're bringing to every session. That's what you're bringing to our field. Yes. to your colleagues and to your life is all that we need all of you. Um, and it's okay if some parts of you take center stage for a while and mm -hmm. then fade away and yeah. it, that things change. Um, just being willing to embrace all of who you really are. Um, I wish that I would have done that more as a student because mm -hmm. I did a lot of faking it. I did a lot <sighs> of, um, I'm, I want to be this person, so I'm going to pretend to be this person. Yeah. And the more that people like Sharon helped peel off the, hey, I know you're faking. <laughs> Let's see what's really <laughs> under here. I can tell. Yes. This is really you. Um, and surround yourself with people who will remind mm -hmm. you when you're not being you. Yeah. Um, it's not fun to hear, but you need to hear it. Mm -hmm. And the more people who love you enough to tell you to be yourself and to embrace who uh, you are, um, the it's just better. Yeah. So much better. Oh, I love that. And, and if you're listening to this and not watching this, I have to tell you that Nate's responses to Beth's answers are also really awesome. So <laughs> and you're lucky enough to be watching the video content. Enjoy. <laughs> Nate, what advice would you give to music therapy students? Um, all I'm going to say is trust the process. Mm. And, I, and I'm not even going to expound. I'm just going <laughs> to leave that and infuriate all right. So much. <laughs> Trust the process. <laughs> so this next question is one of my favorites. So if that's the advice you'd give them, what advice would you tell them to ignore? Because you know that students are getting inundated with all sorts of advice. What advice should they ignore? Oh, gosh. Uh. I would say the advice that you should ignore is any advice that tells you to fake it to fit in. Mm. Anything that tells you, um, okay, well, if you want to be, if you want to practice with this population, then you need to do it this way, even if that's not, even if it doesn't line with your philosophy. Or if you want to start a business, well, then you better be prepared to do X, Y, and Z, even if that's not what you really wanted, because that's what you got to do. Um, I really, I used to really lean into fake it till you make it, but don't fake it. Like, <laughs> be real. Um, and if any anyone who tells you to, to just fake it, anything that tells you to just do it anyway, even if it doesn't feel right for you, I would just say no to that um, because the things that you don't have to fake will come to you. Mm -hmm. um, so don't take opportunities that don't fit who you are yeah. for fear that the other one won't come. Leave space ah. for that. Yes. <sighs> Nate, what should they ignore? Yeah. After, after having some time to think about it. And this is all from personal soapbox at, of, of who I am as a, a therapist um, and a musician, but ignore any time a student, friend, or professor says, well, you can just learn blank. Like you can learn this song, this style, whatever, and then just forget it. Like <laughs> just, just learn it, just learn it for the exam. And then it's fine, you can be done. Uh, I would tell them to ignore that. <laughs> please, please mm -hmm. don't forget it. <laughs> it's very important. You're going to need it someday, musically, I promise you. If anything, it'll help keep on rounding you out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it will come back. <laughs> yeah. Well, bringing the music back here, um, what is some of the music, some of the books that have most influenced both of you? There is this book. Um, Effortless Mastery. Um, Brian Trek gave it to me when when I was still an intern. Um, 
and it's it's by a jazz pianist and it's he's not a music therapist but man oh man i would love to see a, an improv workshop with him he just talks about how sometimes and and not so many words working smarter not harder mm-hmm. via the music but it's an entire book about them really short book not a not a heavy textbook short book easy read um but he just he's just really really talking about like hey like go go with the flow like maybe that means sometimes it's doing this in the music which you think is wrong like but why is it wrong it doesn't have to be wrong and if your gut is saying go there musically then that's where you can go and that's what it is hence the title effortless mastery not not like mastery with effort but Mm -hmm. effortless mastery yeah it's a real great book yeah how about books for you beth is there one that really stands out this is a little off the wall. Um, okay, <laughs> so my it. official like music, music therapy book answered um, <laughs> is um, like, and can you believe it? I just literally blanked on the name. Um, Edith Boxel. Mm. I always just call it the Boxel book. Um, I'm just totally blanking on the name where she talks about her continuum of awareness. Um, that textbook, which I will send you when I think yeah, and we'll put the um, link in the um, program in the notes mm-hmm. for the show. So no worries. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so crucial to my development as a music therapist. And I come back to it often more than any other book. Um, I love her work. Um, but my off the wall answer is Contact by Carl Sagan. Um, you know, the Jodie Foster movie, but the book mm-hmm. for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it is a thick book. <laughs> it is a dense read. And it is an incredible, to me, it was very impactful because the whole book to me, Carl Sagan is masterful in, in a creative um, exploration of his work as an astrophysicist, but also um, this juxtaposition of two characters who are both really sure in what they believe and who they are mm. and have that fundamentally questioned yeah. um, and how they deal with um, having something that they were so sure of shaken up. Um, yeah. it's a beautiful work. It's a real thinker. Um, and it has some really profound thoughts in it. So it's been a really impactful story for me. And, uh, his mm-hmm. writing is also just, he's an incredible writer. So, um, I really appreciate, um, that story and I come back to it often, um, in the way that I look at things. So, ah, oh. how about music? What has been influential for you, Beth? Oh man, so many things. Um, music that has been really influential um, recently. Um, one, I always come back. Eddie Vedder is my. I love his music. Um, I love all of it. Um, I was really drawn to his music from the Into the Wild soundtrack, but then I listened to more of it. And that that music is. Um, it was really special to me. It came in a really special time of growth in my life and. Uh, so it's very special, and I that's kind of my comfort food music. Um, mm. But lately, what's been really influential, I've been listening to a lot of um, listening to a lot of David Bowie. I've been listening to a lot more prog, prog rock, and listening music that really challenges, does something new, do so, does something different, and you listen to it, and you're like, what's happening there? Um, yeah. That's been really influential. Um, I love. I love the sound of it. I love the words. Um, I love the playfulness and the turning expectation on its head. Um, and also, um, another really influential has been um, Nordic folk music. I've been listening mm-hmm. to a lot of Nordic folk. Um, their their use of voice, um, the the simplicity. It's a it's a real opposite of prog rock right like um but the the simplicity of of it and the sound and the different tonal center Uh, they tend to have a more modal center and also a little bit more minor so it's a real different sound than you know i i listen to a lot so i a wide variety a wide variety of things but that's been kind of on the table recently what is the music that's been influential for you nate Oh, like Beth, so many random things. Um, the incredible soundtrack uh, by Michael Giacchino, that's pretty big. Um, Nobuo Uematsu, he's a, a Japanese composer that did lots of the video game music from the Final Fantasy series, lots of that. Um, and then 
you know, a, a whole army's worth of just individual songs, you know. Um, anyone who knows me knows uh, my obsession and love for Bohemian Rhapsody. So <laughs> that, um, so much J-pop and, and J-rock and anime music. Um, so much music by the, the Dirty Loops. There's this, this trio of musicians that does these electro pop funk covers and stuff and it's real cool. And then like um, music from Steven Universe and music for, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's, it's so random, but it's, it's so cool. All these like random different things. I'm, I've just discovered, I'm way, I'm way late to this train, but cartoon lovers. So um, Phineas and Ferb, I just started watching that and they have got some amazing songs in that <laughs> show. I'm like, this is so awesome. <laughs> so, um, so, so many different things. Um, if I can leave it, I can leave it there. <laughs> oh. So would Bohemian Rhapsody be your theme song? If you had a theme song, is that the one it would be? No, I, you know, um, it's very tempting. <laughs> 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 I'm not, I don't, I don't think I could, yeah, I, I don't think I could pull it off though. No. So probably, probably not. I think that uh, a theme song for me would probably either be um, September by Earth, Wind and Fire um, mm -hmm. or, and, and Beth is gonna, I, I can't wait to see Beth's reaction or um, Sell Out by Real Big Fish. <laughs> <laughs> Interview over. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I was prepared. <laughs> oh, Beth, you, what would you your just like, Yeah, you just Go listen. You just listen to that. If you've never heard of it, yeah, type "real real big fish sell out." You, you try not to dance while listening to that song. I dare you. <laughs> it would have been fine if you didn't get my husband like addicted to it, so I had to hear it's an it. Addicting all song. The time. It is. Oh, and it, it will be on the YouTube playlist for this podcast. So Great. it's one of the fun things is to put in the theme songs for the different uh, guest mentors. And so that will be up there. If you can't find it on your own, we'll have it for you. <laughs> Beth, how about for you? What would your theme song be? Ah. Uh... I messaged Nate about an hour before our interview and I said, this question is killing me because I couldn't pick one. I've been like sweating over it. I don't know why it's such a, such a thing. But honestly, if I got to be honest, my theme song probably would be Starman by David Bowie. Aww, Have yeah. it hanging on my wall. I think that's, I think that's mine. I love the line. He's told us not to blow it because he knows it's all, he knows it's all worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I feel like that kind of like. So that's that song. That would probably be my theme song. I love have that. have to go with that one. <laughs> you, you both have shared so much wisdom uh, today. Are there any other final words of wisdom from yourself, from somebody else that you would like to leave with the listeners today? Who's going to go? If you have some, you can go. I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking too. Okay. Um... <laughs> Here's my wisdom. Get to know Nate and Beth if you don't know them. <laughs> I I will preface my word of wisdom by saying I have no clue what I'm doing. Um, so you're learning. Feel free to watch and learn along with me. But I, if I've given any impression mm. that I'm an expert on any of this, it's I'm not. I'm just sharing what I've learned. Um, mm. So there's that. I think the word of wisdom I'd like to leave is I'm, I actually put this in the acknowledgement section at the, of my thesis. Um, and it's a quote from Walt Whitman of a poem when he's talking about life and how life is confusing and it's messy. And why are we putting up with this? Why, what's the point? Yeah. And the poem's going through all of this. Why am I doing this? And it just says, why? And then it says, answer that you are here, that life exists and identity that the powerful play goes on and you will contribute a verse. So that's the why. I just got chills. That you're here and you're contributing a verse mm -hmm. and whatever your verse is, it's the right one. So yeah. that's, that's my word of wisdom of when you ask yourself why, that I think sums it up pretty well. Mm. Hilariously, but not shockingly, mine in a way links to yours. Um, I, and, and we've, we've chatted about this before, but it's been a while. Um, even if you never present, 
teach, publish, perform, or create the next big new intervention, you're still a great music therapist. It's okay. Mm. It's okay if not everyone knows your name. You're still great. Your patients and your clients know your name yeah. and your coworkers know your name. And you know, we're not doing this for fame stuff anyway. Yeah. If, if we are, we're in the wrong field. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, there, are, there are so many other ways to get there are so many other ways to get famous. But yeah, you're still you're still great. Mm -hmm. All the people whose names we've never heard before, you've been doing great things for whether you've been a music therapist for a week or if you've been a music therapist for 50 years or anything in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, I like to give the opportunity for our guest mentors to amplify a voice in music therapy that they think needs to be heard. Mm hmm. Maybe one of those voices who we might not hear all the time or know about whose voice in music therapy would you like to amplify? I think for me, the, the, the voice, I, I don't know if I have a specific like person in mind, mm -hmm. but I think the voices that really need amplified and need to be heard are exactly those people like Nate mentioned, those people mm -hmm. who are just doing the work mm -hmm. and they may not have the opportunity or the, the accessibility or the time or the desire to build a big social media presence and do the side gig and present and, and build the side business, <laughs> like all that sort of stuff. And that's, but they are, they're doing the work. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are so many incredible clinicians out there who like Nate says, we'll never see. But I think those are the people whose voices we need to hear. Yeah. Um, you know, every, everyone's voice has value, but yeah. the people who are, who are doing the work and mm -hmm. doing it without the recognition, um, I think that's, that's special. Um, and I think that their voice needs heard just as yeah. much and we need to listen when they say hey you know we need some help we need some resources we need some some advocacy over here mm -hmm. um i think those are the voices that often kind of get drowned out in the noise um yeah. so i would love to hear see more of them being being brought out and celebrated and and heard absolutely yeah Oh, so hard, <laughs> but, but um, I, 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 if I can remember everything, I think three, three separate groups would be great to amplify. Mm -hmm. um, students, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I mean, they're, yeah. they're the, the next generation. We, we got to listen to what they're saying. <laughs> we, yes. We're, and they're brilliant. They are brilliant. <laughs> yes. We are teaching them but they can do and will do things that we have not even thought of and that celebrate that. Let's change, let's switch things up. So them, um, the people who have quit the field, which is a weird thing to say, but I yeah. want, they quit for a reason, you know, at mm -hmm. some point they thought music therapy was important enough to do. And then at a separate point, they decided it was no longer worth it. Mm -hmm. I, um, yes. so I think that would be very elucidating. And then the third group would be, as Beth said, the silent, mm -hmm. you know, those who have been watching everything from far and, and staying silent on purpose, which there is so much wisdom in silence. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so much wisdom in silence, but, um, maybe if given the opportunity, they'd say something or maybe if we all quieted a little bit <laughs> then maybe they would say something <laughs> yes oh thank you for that oh, beth i know that you would also like to give a shout out to the mamt program at saint mary of the woods college would you like to tell our listeners why I don't have my ring on, Nate. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, I failed. I got you. Okay, I got just, you. just pretend I, I, I have that on. Yeah, yeah, Nate, um, you are the official hand model for the podcast. Oh, and... no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, Nate and I, you know, both went through, went through undergrad at the Woods, went and did our master's at the Woods. Um, but for me, the master's program was so 
influential in shaping me, not only as a clinician, you know, working towards having my master's in that level of training, but really influential in giving me space to explore and grow as a person. Um, and something that I love about the program is I, there was never a feeling of, we're going to put you through the program and then you're going to come out this music therapist on the other side. Mm. Um, every assignment, my thesis, all my presentations, I feel like everything was, the, the question started with, what do you want to explore? What is your philosophy? What yeah. is, what, who do you want to be as a music therapist? And we had such a wide range in our cohort but all of us, you know, stuck it out and we all like really elevated each other and had all these different perspectives and um, philosophically and interpersonally and musically, we just built each other up. Um, so it was it was really influential. And, you know, I know a master's degree isn't for everybody and I don't think it should be for everybody. I think, yeah. you know, there's different paths um, and it was the right choice for me. But continuing to explore that growth and, you know, if you're ever wondering you know why why would I get a master's why would I get a master's there mm -hmm. um for me it, it was yeah there they have built this culture of personal exploration and growth and really contributing and adding what you want to contribute um mm -hmm. and so I think it's a really special place and the faculty are really special and the experiences we had with our cohort and I, I would not be the clinician and person I am now without going through that program. So I'm really mm. grateful for the experience. Thank you, Beth. We will make sure we have that link in the show notes as well, as well as the link to Nate to your course on music therapy ed. Would you like to tell the listeners just a little bit about how they can dive deeper into this topic of musical authenticity with you on music therapy ed? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so if you're looking for ways to dive deeper into musical authenticity, whether you take the course or not, uh, ask yourself this simple question, which is a lot more complex than it sounds. When I am playing blank song, whether on guitar, piano, singing it, how close or far away to the original do I sound? And if I'm far away from the original, which there's definitely a time and place, is there a good clinical reason for that? Or am I just mm. being musically lazy? <laughs> <laughs> and if you are being musically lazy, how do you think that's going to affect your musical relationship with your patients and clients? Mm. That's what I would, yeah. Musician, <laughs> heal thyself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's like you were ready for it, nice. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Thank you again, um, Beth and Nathan, for joining us today. Any last words before I finish this up? This has been great. Thank you so much <laughs> yeah, for thanks. this time. <laughs> thanks for having us. So much fun. We will make sure to include all of these links we've mentioned in our resources for this episode. And thank you to all of our listeners as well. If you haven't already done so, please make sure to subscribe to this MT Mentor podcast today so that you don't miss an episode. And if you want to dive deeper into some of these practices, you can also learn about and join our private membership group at joyfulnoisesllc.com slash mt-mentor. That's www.joyfulnoisesllc.com slash backslash mt-mentor. All music therapy students and professionals are welcome and equity-based pricing is available. Subscribe to this free MT Mentor podcast and join our membership group today, MT Mentor. Let's fill our cups and share our wisdom together.